Yeah. Okay, man, you guys are talking a bunch. I wish we could keep talking for a little bit, but got to keep the trains moving. Um, okay, so we have three speakers from VA, and I'm interested to hear a lot of uh, dialogue about VA earlier. Um, we have Frederick White over here on my far right, um, who is the Chief Governance Strategy uh, at the Veteran Experience Office. Um, so the office that we talked about that's sort of trying to bring in all the CX stuff, uh, veteran experience initiatives across the agency. Uh, in the middle, we have Suzanne Shirley. She's a National Fellow and Entrepreneur in Residence for the Veterans Health Administration Innovation Ecosystem. Um, so she'll be talking a lot about some of the cool tech stuff that they do. I should say Frederick's got policy and overarching strategy kind of covered. And then directly to my right, uh, Michael uh, is the Management and Program Analyst for VA. And he's going to talk a little bit about some really cool stuff he did years ago that has matriculated across the agency in, in a lot of really cool ways. So he'll, you know, his uh, expertise will cover some of the employee experience and some of the cool tech as well. So uh, first things first, VA, uh, huge agency, largest civilian agency there is. But you guys have done a lot of really cool stuff just lately. I mean, yesterday I saw the White House VA hotline announced uh, it's gotten uh, 250,000 calls. It's a 24-7 line where any veteran, uh, spouse, anyone affiliated in, in that arena can call whenever they want with questions and you all get them to the right spot, mm -hmm. basically. So I want you to talk about that. And then I also want to talk about something else that I think is important and maybe a first across the government in that you're sort of baking in veteran experience or CX, as it were, into the core language of a VA for the employee. So take it away. We'll start there. We'll come with some questions later on. but. This guy's got a lot of really cool stuff to talk about. Well, well it was easy to actually start there. Uh, our secretary, our VA secretary, Robert Wilkie, has really made it easy for us because he has identified customer service as the number one priority. Uh, it is our first focus and our first priority in the government, um, in VA specifically. Uh, and so to follow that, he's uh, this last week or so recently, he actually signed an order to actually incorporate customer service into uh, the National Code of Federal Regulations. And it's actually in Part Zero. And the reason that that is important is because Part Zero is where we currently house it, our core values. So when you talk about integrity, compassion, advocacy, respect, excellence, right there is also customer service. It's really at every level of our organization. So um, our Chief Veteran Experience Officer, Dr. Linda Davis, uh, under her leadership, we're currently revising the VA directive for customer service. So when you talk about, well, how are you getting it into the culture, we're starting at the directive. We've been working with our uh, Veteran Integrated Service Networks uh, and our VA medical centers uh, and leaders in, out in the field and they've invited us to say, come to our facility. We want to know how do we continue to improve the customer service uh, at our level. And so we've done that. We've took them up on that offer, and, and we're in the medical centers providing consistent and standardized customer service training. So <clears throat> one of the things that we may uh, train on are, are three principles. And the three principles are three principles that they can use for every single veteran, every single interaction. If they follow these principles, they're gonna be providing exceptional customer service and an exceptional customer experience. And that first principle is really around the dimension of emotion. It's connecting and caring with our veterans. Every single person that comes through the door, we wanna make sure that they understand that we care. We wanna connect with them uh, before we do anything else. The second principle uh, is around the dimension of effectiveness. And what this is, is understanding and responding to their need. If we're gonna provide exceptional customer service, we must first be able to listen, actively listen, understand that need, and then be able to respond to it. And then the third principle is really around ease. Uh, and that principle, or is really around the dimension of ease, but that principle is connecting and caring. N not connecting and caring, it's guiding the journey. And so we're letting them know what they can expect from our system. Uh, this is actually uh, information, training, 
that we give to every employee uh, in our medical center so that we can standardize that expectation and standardize that experience for our veterans. And we're talking about tens of thousands of people. Absolutely. Right? And we'll talk about training in a little bit. So that's kind of an overarching way to lead off our panel. Um, Susan, I want to talk to you a little bit about some of the really cool tech stuff you're doing. There's two things I want to get to. The first one is, uh, is around 3D printing. So talk to us a little bit about how you are improving the lives of veterans through that mechanism. Yeah, OK. Um, that's a fun topic to talk about. Mm -hmm. We're doing a lot in 3D printing. And at the VA, for about 10 years or so, we've been doing 3D printing in assistive technology, which has been a really cool way to design and manufacture solutions right at the patient's bedside with the patient and the care team uh, to improve you know, individuals' lives in real time. Uh, but we've also been working on 3D printing in prosthetics and orthotics. Um, we can scan the surface of a patient's foot. You know, more than 20% of our patients have type 2 diabetes, and so foot, diabetic foot ulcers are a huge issue that we deal with. Um, we can scan the surface of the foot and 3D print customized patient-specific uh, orthotics right there in the prosthetics clinics. Um, but kind of more exciting, excitedly, because it's a new, a new thing that we're uh, working on developing is our ability to provide uh, medical models for pre-surgical planning. And so what we're able to do across the country at a couple different sites, but we serve all the VAs across the country, is uh, we can take CT and MR scans and actually print patient-specific patient medical models that help surgeons prepare better for complex procedures. And some ways that we've done this, some examples that are, are fun to talk about is uh, in Seattle, one of our radiologists, Beth Ripley has worked with an architect to print a patient-specific aortic valve for aortic aneurysm repair surgeries. And the reason this is uh, important is because the standard way to repair an aortic valve, and I'm an, an aortic aneurysm, and I'm not a surgeon, this is just what I've learned. Me either, so. Um, yeah. <laughs> the standard way to do it actually is to, you know, you have a graft that you have to place into the aortic valve. And so you have to have the patient open in order to do that. And there's a number of different sizes of grafts to choose from. So you have the patient open, and then the surgeon there is opening two to three different grafts, which are $20,000 each, in order to find the right size for the patient. And so when we can print, when we can print a medical model of a patient-specific aortic valve, we can do the sizing before the procedure. So we know exactly what size graft to use, and we're not spending money opening up graphs that, that don't need to be opened. And even better than the saving money part is that the procedure then becomes laparoscopic. Mm -hmm. And so it's saving time and money in the OR. It's improving patient outcomes. Um, another example that's, that's really cool that we also did in Seattle was a, we printed a patient's heart, a medical model of a patient's heart for a surgeon to prepare and practice a really complicated procedure. It was a hypertrophic. Uh, cardiomyopathy procedure where he actually had to shave out part of the inner wall of a heart and you don't need to be a surgeon to know that you don't want to do too little or too much right. uh, in that so it really helped him to actually be able to prepare and do surgery on the the model of the heart beforehand and then he actually brought the pieces that he'd removed from the model into the operating room with him so that he could compare the pieces that he was actually removing from the patient's heart and he compared them so so finely that he even dropped the little pieces into a vial of, of water to measure the volume to make sure it was exactly right. And that's the level of precision that many of our procedures need and many of our surgeons need. Uh, that, that's, I mean, you hear governments behind the times and a lot of different stuff, but that is pretty cool. I didn't know you were gonna, I didn't even know about that. So yeah. you can 3D print like heart models. Yeah. Do pre-surgery, kind of make sure you know what you're doing. I mean, I'm sure they do know what they're doing, but I mean, that's just, that's just, Freaking cool. Um, we'll come back to you. Yeah. We'll come back to you because I know there's other cool stuff that you guys do too. Michael, I had a chance to uh, engage with you uh, probably a month ago. There was an internal sort of VA wide event that um, folks from across the country, across various more than 100 medical centers, were attending and sort of pitching some of the cool ways that they've used the technology that you helped create uh, almost a decade ago, right? right. And this uh, open source code is now being used all across VA, various medical centers for uh, myriad purposes. And some of these purposes are saving large amounts of money, making things more efficient, uh, giving, uh, empowering employees to just get stuff done. So I want you to talk a little bit, give, it, give a high level view of what you, what you did and the, the code that you did and, and kind of how it's starting to 
really impact the agency. I think it's a really cool story. So a lot of the work uh, that goes behind it is actually, it's, it's powering a system that basically supports our frontline staff, uh, basically working at VA offices. Uh, and primarily, we, at least when we started, it was focused on resource uh, management. So anytime a facility needs to uh, uh, hire a new uh, physician or if they need to get space, the idea is that when you hire someone, we would also be able to handle their space equipment, IT needs, so that when they're onboarded that day, everything's already in place. They don't have to wait for their uh, IT equipment or anything like that. So as this has grown, so this is a uh, it's been in kind of in progress for about a decade. We should explain it's a LEAF. Wait, wait, yeah, oh, yes. The application itself is uh, called LEAF, stands for Light Electronic Action Framework. Um, and it really kind of, it just uh, really means that it's, uh, it's a lightweight application designed to allow um, people to you know, build their own business processes uh, as they need to. Um, so over time, we've just focused on basically this kind of a, a loop where we identify what the pain points are for our customers. Uh, in this case, it's frontline staff at uh, VA medical centers. Um, you know, find out how we can improve it. Uh, sometimes interview uh, them to see you know where their uh, where their needs are. Uh, implement them and just kind of start over again. So when you started, you started as a sort of lone wolf with your team. You had issues that you ran into. At the was it the DC facility? Right, this was at the DC Medical Center. And then Sorry. it's sort of it's an open source web app. Uh, it's actually pretty easy to use. You don't have to be a, a coding guru to actually use it. Right. Right. And now you guys have sort of evangelized this across VA's huge enterprise, which is you know a couple hundred thousand people, right, Frederick, that work for VA, approximately 300,000, 300, yeah. yeah. supporting at least nine million. Uh, veterans who just get care every year, not to mention all the other veterans that, that are out there. Um, talk about some of the ways it's being used now. And some of the metrics that I heard presented at that sort of internal conference, which is a way that you evangelize it and sort of show, show off the work that it's doing. Um, they were reducing employee onboarding times by half. Um, they were eliminating huge stacks of paper. There were, there were folks from different VA centers that were bringing in, this is how much paper we needed to hire people in the past. And it's all digital now. And it's all run on the same framework that you helped start. Right. Um. <laughs> There's a lot of places but, you can go with that. Yeah. Uh, basically, if you can imagine any kind of business process at a facility, um, the idea is that we would be able to easily standardize this. So we, basically, the tool allows frontline personnel, they, they are directed by their uh, supervisor to um, you know, handle some process, right? So you know, how can they do this? Now, they need some tools in order to make that uh, happen. Um, and we provide Leap as a way to do that. Um, and kind of along these lines, you know, as we've grown, um, the focus now is uh, you know, standardization. Because while this has grown uh, fairly organically at various medical centers, um, you know, we s realize that there is some variability, especially depending on you know, even how big a medical center is. You know, one medical center might not um, uh, you know, they might have, not have all the same processes as another one. So there is going to be some variability. Uh, but the idea is that we would be able to actually, at a high level, um, uh, combine all the sites using our the LEAF API, which allows a like, national type dashboard um, to uh, kind of ingest all of the timeline metrics coming from all the various sites. Uh, one of the first. Uh, of the or first implementations of these kind of national type sites is our uh, HR classification sites. So uh, nationally now, any time a position has been classified, uh, they go through the system. There's at least 20 different LEAF sites uh, <coughs> in various regions, uh, but they all report through this one dashboard. So at a glance, a uh, senior executive can look at that and see immediately what the uh, timeline kind of response is. I was amazed to hear at that event some of the HR folks come in and say it used to take between 40 and 50 emails sent between a hiring manager and the HR staff to just get interviews lined up for new potential employees that you want to bring in. And I mean, of course, things can get lost in the shuffle. Um, it's just not an efficient way to do business. And they said that through this framework now, there's no emails that are sent. And they can, I mean, the metrics were pretty impressive. Uh, we'll come back to some of the, some of the other uses. Fredrick, I want to go back over to you, too. 
So you talked, uh, you talked about uh, ease and, and efficiency and whatnot. There's also three other sort of principles that you guys are, well, initiatives, I should say, that have sort of come from this. Own the moment, um, we care, leadership rounding, and then Red Code Ambassador Program. And I'd like you to talk about those because I think they probably have some parallels where other uh, practitioners in the federal space may be able to benefit from them. No, I think that that's great. And, and I'll say that the foundation of a lot of those tools really starts with the voice of our customer veterans. And so um, what we do now is before we make any changes, before we make any process improvements, before we identify where we need to spend, where we need to uh, utilize our resources, we go back and we hear from our customer. So we go out to the field and we conduct research. We're, we're meeting with them one-on-one -on -one in groups to understand some of their bigger needs or concerns. We pull all of this information together on a journey map. And so that journey map would include some of the things that are already going well, bright spots, and then some of the opportunities that we have to further improve what we call pain points. As we're collecting research, we begin to hear some of the same things over and over and over. Uh, and I'm going to give you an example specific to outpatient. Um, for our outpatient research, uh, when we went out and we started talking to veterans, we asked them questions about uh, before their visit, uh, what are their experience during their visit, and what, what is their experience after their visit. And they gave us this feedback. And from this feedback, we identify what we call moments that matter the most to our customer. These are those opportunities to improve that we heard across the country. So based on one of the moments that matter, uh, when, when veterans come to our facility, they say, wow, I walk into the facility, maybe this is my first time, this is huge, it's bigger than I thought it was, I may not, I, I may not be sure of where to go, I need someone that can help guide me, uh, help provide the way, provide some information, answer questions. And we said, okay, that's a moment that matters to you. What we're going to do is to, is to actually begin to design our processes, our programs, and even our solutions around those moments that matter the most. And so that's where that Red Code Ambassador Program comes from. We heard the voice of our customer. We identified that moment that matter, and the solution is the Red Code Ambassador Program. Now, what is the Red Code Ambassador Program? When you walk into a VA now, anywhere across the country, one of the first persons that you will run into is a Red Code Ambassador. They'll be dressed in a red vest, and they will meet you at the door to, to greet you and see if they can help direct you to where you need to go. That's not just in DC, that's in every medical center across the nation. So when you talk about standardizing customer service, um, that's one of the ways that we've been able to do it. Hmm. That's cool. Gives them like a, a sense of comfort right away. Instead Absolutely. Of, you know, because a lot of these people are dealing with some pretty serious issues. Mm -hmm. um, there's a couple other things we'll come back to, Frederick, and we got about 10 minutes left, so if you have questions, start thinking about them. Susan, there was another thing that really was cool uh, that we were talking about, and it had to do with predicting Parkinson's. Um, most people are probably familiar with that disease, um, but there is really cool research that originated in VA, within VA that's going to have some major ramifications for patient care across, well, across the country and across the world soon. So I want you to talk a little bit about that. And just hype, hype up VA a little bit, because this is cool stuff. <laughs> Great, yeah. Well, I love talking about this specific project because not only is it exciting, but this researcher, I'm lucky to say, is a good friend of mine. It's uh, George Gitchell down in Richmond, Virginia. Has been He started at the VA as a resident and started doing some research. He's a neuro researcher. Um, and he started tracking the eye movement of the patients that came in through the Parkinson's clinic. And through tracking over 5,000 patients' eye eye movements, he designed algorithms to understand different things that were happening neurologically with patients. And he, the algorithms that he designed have now been run through machine learning and artificial intelligence and have been refined by more and more and more data. Now I think it's over 100,000 patients that have been tracked, healthy patients, patients who have Parkinson's, patients who are young, old, you know, all across the spectrum. Um, and these algorithms can now predict Parkinson's with 
100% accuracy 10 years before the onset of symptoms. And of course, you know, the clinical impact of his work is notable, but what's really interesting from an innovative standpoint as well is that the application of these algorithms goes far beyond veteran healthcare, and it even goes beyond healthcare. The algorithms are now being used in collegiate sports to predict a high school student's future success as a professional athlete. They're being used in the public school system to identify learning challenges sooner and offer individualized educational to support to students faster. And the applications of these algorithms that were designed and developed at the Richmond VA Medical Center in the Parkinson's Clinic are just having exponentially, the applications of these are exponentially growing. Talk a little bit about the, the team that you're part of, the innovation ecosystem, because that's something I think might be useful too. Not all, all agencies have those types of teams, but how do they work? How many people are involved? What do you do? So, on, so the innovation ecosystem spans across the entire nation. It's actually made up of an innovators network, which is comprised of 36 or 38 participating medical centers. At these medical centers, you know, we fund um, innovation, the cultivation of innovation at the patient's bedside with the care teams uh, to develop real-time solutions. At these medical centers, we also not only cultivate internal innovation with these teams of researchers and engineers and clinicians and patients all working together to design solutions, but we also build partnerships with industry and academia on the local level so that we can really expand our ability to solve some of the problems. One of the things we're working on through the innovation ecosystem is a partnership with MIT where we're hosting and facilitating hackathons in major cities across the country where engineers and healthcare providers and mathematicians and scientists and entrepreneurs, they're all coming together to solve some of our biggest challenges. And oftentimes, you know, a lot of things happen at those hackathons and hundreds of solutions are developed. But if we're lucky, one or two emerge and we can engage them with teams of four or five clinical stakeholders to really develop that solution further and engage with those teams of industry and academia and healthcare to make sure that our veterans and our providers are getting access to cutting edge solutions, cutting edge medical technology and treatments for our patients. Mm -hmm. All right, um, I've got some time for questions. There's a mic around somewhere. So if any of you guys have questions on strategy, tech, anything else, I'd love to hear them and bombard these guys, if there are any. Not yet. Oh, you got one over here. Just a second, wait for the, there's a microphone right behind you coming. So this question is for Frederick. How did you pay for the red jacket people? That sounds like an en enormous expense. <laughs> How did we pay? That's always the big question, right? Um, actually, it was a partnership with our voluntary services uh, department. Um, and, and then uh, there were other, there may be other funding, uh, other sources of funding that we utilize. So are most of these people doing this uh, for, uh, they're volunteering at these facilities then? Actually they are. Uh, these are volunteers and volunteers make up a critical component of our organization. We could not do what we do, or VHA could not do what they do uh, without the volunteers. Uh, and so uh, our hats go off to our volunteers. On the hotline stuff too, I mean, you bring up budget and, and paying for things, it's not always easy to do, right? But you guys have, that, that hotline that you put up has got a quarter of a million calls in, since it started. And it seems to be a model for how call centers will work at VA going forward. 24 seven access, call whenever, we'll figure out how to help you. How, I mean, is it, is it just because the secretary and previous secretaries going back to, I think, Bob McDonald, who's, who launched the VE wing, is it just because they've just decided this is the way it's gonna be, customer service matters the most? Or is it, do you have to take frontline feedback and elevate it up? How do you do that? Well, I mean, you bring up some, some great points. It does, it did start with, uh, we've seen this consistent leadership for a number of our secretaries, um, and, and we're thankful for that. But you, meant to, you mentioned before, own the moment. And I think that that's a critical component of what you're describing. For own the moment, what we're challenging every person in the system to do is own every single interaction. Again, every single veteran, every single time, this is the opportunity for you to provide exceptional experience. This is the opportunity for you to provide that wow moment, to go over and above uh, what that request is, to make them feel 
um, like we've heard their concerns and that they are a valued member. And so on the moment is critical to that effort. And that's part of the training that you, you give these tens of thousands of people across Absolutely. the VA. Gotcha. A question over here in the, in the middle. Frederick, this is for you. How do you determine, is there a human factor that you're looking for in an individual that's going to be able to interact with this veteran? Uh, being a veteran myself and having been into the different types of facilities, I'd like to give a shout out to the Perryville one. Um, <laughs> but what I found is the people in Perryville have a certain, I care. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you see that actually at a number of our, our medical centers. I, I always use the example, there is nobody in our system that comes to work in the morning and says, you know what, I can't wait till I get there so I can screw over a veteran, so, <laughs> so I can mess up today. Uh, everybody in our system believes in the mission and they want to do a good job. And so we're just a part of the process. We're providing those processes, those systems that really allow and and really empower the employees to do that. And so that's the important component there. Question in the back. And then we have one in the front. And then to the left. Uh, really great panel. Thank you guys so much. And thanks for the work you're doing with the VA. It's really, really inspiring. Um, I'm, I was actually so inspired by what you were saying and all the changes you've made that I was wondering if there's something that you are doing, that the VA is doing to make some of these changes known to people because I have some friends who are part of the VA system or you know, being treated at the VA uh, centers, and some who say they don't want to go because they're, they're horrible facilities. It's kind of like an outdated, you know, bad, bad reputation. But you guys are doing such great things. I think it's great for people to know. Is there something that you're doing? How are you, yeah, how are you championing that work? Marketing I, I, I think you bring a, up a great point because uh, we hear that same feedback as we go around and we visit facilities across the nation. Uh, when I see a veteran today and, and they talk about a bad experience that they had and I start to ask questions about that experience, sometimes I receive a response. I might ask, you know, when did you go last? And, th and they may say, well, that was 20 years ago. And I say, <laughs> well, VA is, you know, has made some changes since that time. We are a, a different system. And again, we talked about the focus from, from the top. Uh, to the employees that are engaged and want to make a difference. What I would encourage you to tell that veteran is to give us another chance. Come, try us out because again, right now our focus is on customer service and making sure that we give them, deliver an exceptional customer experience. All right, um, Michael, uh, too, on the, the stuff that you've done, are, and maybe Frederick as well, are you able to work across other agencies? I mean, is there a potential use of, of stuff like LEAF at, say, uh, agriculture, or these other agencies that, that deal with lots of people as well? Yeah, so this uh, topic has definitely come up. Um, and we've actually uh, architected the system so that it's not actually just VA only. So it's designed in a way that um, it can potentially be transplanted, uh, but we're still trying to figure out how best to uh, kind of govern that because the last thing we want is to, again, split off into different directions where we're duplicating effort again. Um, we want to be able to focus our development on kind of like the general need to be able to provide a uh, common framework that would uh, apply to all these types of business, business processes. Mm -hmm. um, and I think as we get there, uh, we probably would have more news. Um, is, and, and that code that you, you guys use for all these processes, many of which are similar across agencies, that's, that's on GitHub, right? If you're a tech right. person, you, you can go there. And right now it's on GitHub. We actually, or I encourage, we're still working on the team, uh, people to actually, uh, if they see something they want changed, uh, just submit a pull request. Uh, we can just review the change um, and then import it into our code. What's your engagement level across other federal agencies? And Susan, if you have any in there as well, it might be interesting to hear. Well, again, I attribute this to our, uh, our patient experience director, Jennifer Purdy. Uh, and she's just been excited about collaborating with other federal agencies. Um, and for those that don't know, we just recently had a PX symposium uh, where we brought in all of the leadership across VA, uh, a, a number of our VA leaders to educate them and, and to explore ways that we together can continue to improve customer experience. Uh, that effort now is beginning to spread, 
to other federal agencies. We're actually the, the leader uh, right now uh, of helping to share our PX model. And so we're supportive of spreading that PX as far as we can. We had two questions. Uh, Don, did you have a question? I did have a question, but you already asked it, so I'm good. Oh, <laughs> asked would I get paid the big bucks to <laughs> mind read. We've got one question over here um, at the front left table there. Good morning. Uh, I'm a Navy vet. Thank you for what you're doing. Uh, you. One theme we keep hearing is that how you organize CX has an impact on the results that we get. Uh, the Veterans Experience Office is uh, new, but trying to manage CX through your uh, business line verticals. What growing pains have you had in getting that office stood up uh, and, uh, and listened to by your business lines? You know, that's a good question. Uh, and, and I'll be frank uh, with you because I was actually one of the, uh, the individuals that made a conversion from being a part of the, one of the addition, other business lines at the facility to uh, actually moving and in, in, in transferring to the Veteran Experience Office. Uh, initially, it was tougher because uh, they wanted to understand the value that we were bringing. They wanted to understand how we were going to be helping them to provide a better overall experience for the customer. Um, but through some of the things that, that we've named, through some of the research that we've provided, through some of the journey maps uh, that we've been able to develop, uh, we've also developed a roadmap that has been beneficial to some of our key stakeholders. And what that roadmap allows uh, VHA facilities to do specifically is to identify where they are on this PX journey. So I can identify if I'm kind of starting up in this PX journey, if I'm kind of in the middle of maturing, or if I, pretty, I have a, a pretty robust PX program in place. And based on where I am in that process, uh, there's a corresponding guidebook that will tell me what are the specific steps that I need to take to get to the next level. And so, again, this is a systematic way that we're hardwiring CX into our, our programs, our processes, and our systems. And one really cool thing, too, that they've done even recently is, is at each VA medical center, which there are over 100 across the country, they each have someone who is charged with CX, with leading that effort, whether it's by title as a chief customer officer at the Absolutely. medical centers or by at least duties. And Absolutely. I think that's cool, too. Uh, I'd like to talk a lot more about this panel. We can't. I just think it's one of the coolest examples of technology uh, saving lives, saving taxpayer dollars even, um, improving the employee experience through just, that was a cool like project that you did. And, and look at what it does now. It's used by 50,000 VA employees to save money, to be more effective, and then coming up with a strategy to actually make it part of the mission essentially. And I think that's great. You also bombard them with questions before they leave if you can. Um, we've got another panel coming up, um, but yeah, thanks for listening.